before I start, I want to say thank you to this incredible committee of people who put together this day. Yay! <laughs> and in particular, I also wanted to give a shout out to my colleague, Elena Georgi. Uh, she invited me to speak today, and she's put a lot of energy into the scientific program, um, and also the booths that you guys can look at. So I'm so proud to stand with New Mexico in support of science, and I'm going to first start this talk by a little time travel. Many of you guys have already embarked on time travel yourselves by exploring a family tree or genetic testing to discover your roots and your DNA, reaching back and trying to imagine the world of your ancestors. But there is one profound difference in their lives that it is very hard for us to imagine from our viewpoint. And it's not the lack of cell phones. It's this. Throughout the arc of human history, people were intimate with death in a way that we are not. When a new baby is born into our families, our expectation is that, of course, we're going to get to see this little one grow up. Our children will outlive our, their parents. But this is not the way it's always been. This is actually a gift that science gave us. Our, so our first stop on a journey through time is going to be Kval Hoyuk, which is in the present day Turkey. We're going to go back about 7,000 years. I think we should stop there because they were just beginning to invent beer. Let's not go back any further. There's a thousand years of burials in Kval Hayuk, and they tell a story to scientists who can read the bones. Forty percent of the babies died before they reached the age of five. Only one in ten people made it to 40 years old. How many of you, like me, are over 50 and will admit it? All right, lots of you guys. All right. We're all right out. Everybody's dead by 50. Okay, so now we're going to fast forward and we're going to go about 7,000 years and wind up in 1730 London. Now, beer's on tap, and we can get a good cup of coffee and some lively political debate in the local coffee house. There's a gentleman across town named John Marshall, and he's busy compiling the bills of mortality. And he's documenting the cause and age of every death in London, death by death. 7,000 years have gone by, and surprisingly little has changed. Things are actually worse for London's babies. 45% won't make it to five. So can you imagine looking at a preschool class and thinking 45% of these kids are not going to make it to five? If you do make it past childhood, odds are a little bit better. About 20% of people make it to 50 years, and a few people even make it to old age. But what were all these young Londoners dying of? Well, if you're going to peer over John Marshall's shoulder, you get a grim glimpse. Most often, it's infectious diseases. The king's evil, tuberculosis, worms, the purple and spotted fevers, infected teeth, death by infected teeth. I don't know about you, but I think I'd like to come back to San Fe, 2017, beautiful spring day, our age of miracle and wonders. So now our babies, they almost always get to grow up. Only six out of a thousand don't make it to five. Heart attacks and cancer are the leading killers, but those are the diseases of old age. 95% of us live past 50, and we get, on average, 79 years of life. So our lives are really different than our ancestors. What's changed? Clean water, antibiotics, vaccines, but something more subtle as well. Louis Pasteur was the man whose experiments led to the acceptance of the germ theory of disease, and he had a wonderful statement that many of you know, chance favors only the prepared mind. Another change in our times, through science, we collectively have a prepared mind. We can discover a new disease outbreak swiftly when it arises. We have a clarity of purpose when we discover something new and dangerous. We isolate the bug that causes the outbreak. We figure out how it's transmitted. We figure out how to treat it. And we figure out how to vaccinate against it. Recent decades have brought us many nightmares. Ebola, SARS, Zika, HIV, drug-resistant tuberculosis, and hantavirus right here in New Mexico. And we respond through our science. We respond. Sometimes it's very difficult, difficult, and still we respond. And your tax dollars pay for this American response. And I personally think it's a very good deal. Oh. <laughs> My life's work focuses on HIV vaccines, and to this day, I'm motivated by witnessing firsthand a turnaround in that expectation that children should get to outlive their parents. I watched helpless as two very dear friends died of AIDS in the 1990s. They died in their 20s. 
One was my next door neighbor growing up, Kevin. He was a sweet little boy, I babysat him. He grew up into a fine, funny, and generous man, and HIV took him. The other was my housemate for five years, Brian, who actually was one of the most extraordinary scientific minds that I've ever encountered. AIDS kills in many ways, and Brian's beautiful mind was lost to dementia, and that was the one thing he feared most. My friend's deaths were very slow, and they were hard. Their brave moms were by their side constantly to help them endure the pain of the last months of their lives. These memories I hold in my heart, these wonderful men and their beautiful families, what they suffered and what was lost. AIDS was discovered in 1981. It was 16 very long years before through science we figured out how to treat it with good success. But even now, HIV infections are never cleared. Antiretroviral therapy is hope in life, but it is also expensive and arduous. It's a lifetime of three drugs a day. Drug resistance can evolve. Drugs have hard side effects sometimes, and too many people still don't have access to treatment. The HIV pandemic is not over, but it's no longer news, and so it falls from our attention. The WHO estimates that 37 million people are living with HIV and that there are 2 million new infections and over a million AIDS deaths every year. The sorrow of a million deaths is impossible to comprehend. When I try to begin to understand that, I remember that every single one of them is somebody's Kevin and somebody's Brian. In the US, the CDC estimates that 1.2 million people are living with HIV and a working vaccine would turn this epidemic around. How? Well, so now for some science. Your immune system has the remarkable ability to distinguish self, that would be you, from non-self, that would be all the things that try to infect you. When you get a new infection, your immune system goes into battle, but it takes a while to ramp up. Meanwhile, that new pathogen will take hold and it will use your body to copy itself and to, as a conduit to infect other people. When you survive and clear an infection, some of your immune response lingers and is left behind and you harbor this as a memory cell. These memory cells are poised and they're waiting to protect you if you should ever encounter the same pathogen again. Then your immune response will be swift and potent and precise because you remember what you've seen before. The way a vaccine works is by using an inactivated pathogen or maybe just a fragment, some little bit, that doesn't get you sick but can still trigger a good immune response. Vaccines leave behind these memory cells that you need to protect yourself should you later encounter a real and dangerous pathogen. We still don't have an HIV vaccine. It's a particularly difficult and challenging problem. HIV infects the immune system itself and it's highly variable. So it's a little bit different in every single infected individual. Still, we're making steady progress and I'm hopeful. Finally, I wanna give you some thoughts about Trump's proposed 20% cut to the NIH budget. You've heard a bit about it already today. Boo! <laughs> Much of human health research done in our country is seeded through the NIH. It keeps us as a nation at the cutting edge of medical advances. It's how we fuel innovation, and it's how we train the next generation of scientists. A 20% cut is a real cut. It will close the door on many promising research directions that are currently underway, and great momentum will be lost. Remember the words of Dr. Pasteur, chance favors only the prepared mind. Our national science programs, whether they be climate or the NIH or other programs, are our collective prepared mind. We need to attend to the health of our people. We need to attend to the health of our planet, and science enables that. Thank you all for doing your part today, for standing with science. Never take your citizenship for granted.